Um, I want to talk about some of your adventures that you've had. You referenced uh, bribing the police in Mexico. So yes. what is the right and wrong way to bribe the police in Mexico? <laughs> first of all, first of all, uh, this is for educational purposes only, okay? Um, I, I had to transit Mexico multiple times in various guises. I actually had to drive through there on one occasion to get things to my property in Guatemala. <clears throat> I, um, I'm trying to think of all the times I've had to bribe officials there. Um, <clears throat> these people work for very little pay, okay? They are not interested in... Um, Obviously, when I say there's a right and a wrong way to do it, obviously, if you're offensive about it, um, it helps to speak the language. But it, you could do it, right, even if you don't speak good Spanish. Uh, there's kind of universal understanding. Um, if somebody's working for, I don't know, five bucks a day, I mean, I, I don't know what a, a cop in Mexico, a state police in Mexico, they're very intimidating. Um, they run around in great big brand new, like Chevy trucks, uh, painted black usually, right? They're very heavily armed, right? They got the whole intimidation factor on their side. And there's soldiers uh, that, that traverse the highways. Uh, they keep a very obvious national, the national police is the army, right? They keep a very high profile, especially in tourist areas. I suppose that's supposed to make everyone feel at ease, but we were driving down the coast near um, Tampico. But as we passed down the highway there, uh, I remember, I don't know exactly what part we were in, um, I had to relieve myself on the side of the road. Just so happens a cop drove by and he, he, he stops. He said, how dare you? I can't believe you would do that. It's very, like there's garbage absolutely everywhere. There's like a dead buzzard over here, right? And, uh, and plastic trash. Like the way some parts of Mexico are very trashy. Not all, but some. And this was, goodness, this was, you know, 20 plus years ago. And uh, I spoke good Spanish at the time. And the way you don't bribe somebody is to offer outright to pay them to make it go away, right? But I stood there and I listened to him and you'd be very polite and you sort of yes sir them um, as best you can, right, while he's talking. And then, right, without moving, without doing anything else, you suggest that there must be some way to take care of this problem without having to go down to the station. Gee, what could that be? You don't reach for money. You don't take out a wad of 20s and start, right, that's a good way to, to, to truly get robbed. Um, but you suggest that there must be a way to fix this. Um, if you speak Spanish, you would say something like, well, I imagine there must be a fine associated with this. How much is that fine? And how do I take care of that now? Right? Things like this will at least, I, I, I doubt that every cop is open to being bribed, although most of them are. But if you come about it the right way, they appreciate that kind of commerce. They really do. They really do appreciate it. I had to drive my car back through Mexico, same trip. Um, and my pocket got picked uh, about two days before I was set to leave. I got my pocket picked riding a bus in Guatemala, um, lost my license, got to the border with Mexico. Now, um, most people don't know this, but Mexico uses what's called the Napoleonic Code or Napoleonic Law. Napoleonic Law is the opposite of English common law that we're all used to when we think of legal system uh, here in North America. Um, you are not innocent until proven guilty. You are guilty until we sort it out. And so the way they, uh, uh, they, the way they control you transiting through their country with a vehicle is that you have to pay a certain uh, insurance license permit in case you kill somebody or crash it and wreck somebody else's uh, property. Um, they know that they have you and they, it's a bond essentially, right? You're, you're, you're putting money into a bond that is then, uh, it's like an insurance premium. Okay, but I couldn't get one because I didn't have a driver's license. And so same routine. I said, wow, you know, when I came south, uh, I said, it's not my fault. Obviously, I got my pocket picked. There's nothing I can do. He knew that I had transited south because I had my papers. They only give you 90 days with a vehicle in, in Guatemala. And so I knew I had to get out. They knew because they had a record that I had transited before. They had a reasonable assumption that I would make it to the other side. And I said, there must be a way to to cover the cost of the insurance that I need in order to transit north, I wonder how much that would cost me, right? And these kinds of suggestive questions where you're not being too obtuse, you're certainly not openly, openly trying to bribe people. Like, don't think that you're in a, you know, a Hollywood film and that you're gonna you know, sort of John Wayne your way out of stuff. That's very, very offensive to, to most working people. Could you do it today? I don't know. You know uh, in some places you can, there's no question. Uh, an attorney that I work with actually got he got jacked hard coming from Belize to, to Texas. 
he got hassled by the cops multiple times. I said, but my friend, you know, why, why didn't you have some throw down money? Why didn't you have some way to actually just placate these people so that they would leave you alone? And I, I wasn't there, so I didn't really see how the whole thing went down. But he's an old guy. He's a very wealthy attorney. Um, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't in the right mind frame and wasn't, he's not the kind of character who's going to take care of those kinds of problems. But my point is, um, there's a way that, that life operates. There's a way that people operate in the way they think in these countries. And you have to know that. You have to understand that ahead of time. Very often, your biggest enemy is the cops. If you get uh, you know, your passport stolen in a place like Guatemala, the last place you're going to go is to the police. Uh, you can't go to the, especially if you're, a, I remember a woman and her daughter went up to the police and ended up getting hassled even worse. They're lucky they got out of there with nothing bad happening to them. You have to understand that in some cases, it's the officialdom that is the enemy. And there's a way around that. You have to, you know, you have to know enough about local custom to make sure you're not a victim of that kind of thing. Well, how do you get to know that local custom? Because I think what you just said is going to scare a lot of people out of wanting to, to kind of take that step and, and travel abroad. But Understood. Yeah, understood. It shouldn't, though. And the reason that it shouldn't is because, first of all, things like this are very, very rare. Second of all, um, you know, understanding that you're not in a place where people are held to the same kind of standards and ethics um, and all the rest, but that life does go on just fine. Knowing... Uh, being in with the people in the community generally means actually taking part in their lives. Every place I've gone, obviously after I learned good Spanish, it's much, much easier to find yourself um, welcome in, in any given uh, context or any given location. But just knowing um, people in the area, I mean, if you're friends with a mayor in a tiny town, you're not going to get hassled. It's, it's that simple. And inviting the mayor to your house for dinner is nothing in most of these places. And so um, it's true that there is a level of, of um, risk, right, that exists that we don't think of. I mean, I've been hassled by police in the United States for various silly things like traffic offenses by somebody who wanted to be a tough guy. But you're not bribing your way out of that. No one would even think to do such a thing. I'm not saying that it hasn't happened. I'm saying that it's not your first instinct to do that. My point is that you can navigate officialdom uh, with a lot. It's, it is, quite frankly, a kind of corruption that works rather than right a kind of corruption where you have no access to it which is what we really have in north america where it's like you know these people get to make decisions and like you, you can take it or leave it right you can like you're going to take it and like it basically and that's that's sort of what we have in north america it's a much more granular sort of down uh or an earthy kind of corruption that exists throughout latin america and it works if you need to get your way out of stuff you can do it that's my point it's actually a good thing yeah, the problem with corrupt cops in America is when you run into one, there's, there is no way to bribe them. Like, yeah. you're actually just at their whim. You're going to jail. Uh, they're going to hold, like, they hold everything over you. There is no outlets for it. So um, I'd rather deal with a corrupt cop that it can be bought off than a corrupt cop that can't, quite frankly. Exactly. And my point in telling you these stories is not to frighten you. My point is there's a way around it. There's a way to deal with it. There's a way to navigate it. But it doesn't help to be naive. And while maybe you're not going to learn, you know, fluent Spanish, you know, in the two weeks before you're, you, you head off to your vacation in Mexico or whatever, just be aware that you're in an environment where there are solutions to problems. Those, those solutions are okay, right? Those solutions exist and you're perfectly uh, okay to try to explore them as long as you're not being super obtuse about it and in, in a way that might also make them nervous. Like, yeah, but I don't want to get caught taking this, right? You can't be that obvious about it, right? I think it, it's a good rule of thumb. So just out of curiosity, Let's say I'm in Guatemala and I lose my passport. What do I do besides going to the cops? No, you would go to the, to the American embassy. And obviously when you travel, right, very simple checklist, have a photocopy of your passport. Put it in three different, you know, put it in this bag, put it in this bag, put it in another bag. Just a photocopy is enough because at least it proves that, right, it's very, it's very nobody is going to take on face value that you faked that, right? If you got to get to a place like, no, my passport really was lifted. I am who I say I am. And keep a separate, right? I always keep separate identities. They can, they can look up your passport number. It'll have your picture they right there. They can look it up immediately. Very, very easily prove that very the picture is legit. Very quickly confirm it. Exactly, exactly. That's a simple hack for, for travelers. Yep. So I want to talk about some of your other adventures because you have, uh, just based on the fact that you practiced medicine uh, in some of these countries in Latin America, you have very different experiences. I and mean, you've, you've kind of put yourself uh, in the line of fire more than most people would have. Can you talk about your uh, kind of, you, you went down to Panama at one point on some medical uh, excursions. Can you talk about that? I did. Um, actually, most of the medical missions that I ran. So if we rewind for about 30 seconds here, I met a medicine man in the year 2000 
in the highlands in Guatemala, in this little pueblo where I sort of washed the shore uh, oh. after uh, six months at sea. And uh, I felt like I had something really valuable to learn there and I ended up putting down roots and I still own property there. He was my mentor for, uh, I, I, I sort of budgeted for, obviously I offered to pay him for his expertise. And it was an official kind of like, this was a, a formal training as far as between him and me. Um, it was something that we planned out and sort of, this is what I want to cover. And I was able to design my own curriculum with his guidance about what he thought was most important for me. He was just an excellent, excellent, like superb natural healer. He's about 30 years older than me. I believe he's still alive. Uh, in reasonable health. I, I saw him a few years back when I was down there. Um, superb, like really skilled, very professional. He was the kind of guy that other people just wanted to be around. He had that whole healing vibe, but he was an excellent, he was no nonsense. He was, he was a really jovial, kind of very colorful character, but he was also had no nonsense uh, side to him when it came to healing. And he helped, you know, people who had been to the hospital and like the doctors couldn't do anything, they came to Jaime. They came to my mentor and I watched how he operated. I learned not just medicine from a technical clinical standpoint, ways that you could help, you know, migraines and, you know, you know, knee pain and, and, and actual protocols, um, but also how he managed himself as a healer and that this was a very, very key part of my career as well. I ended up getting a license to practice in the United States. I still keep it active. Um, in 2005. And so I, I took my education and really ran with it. This was something that was very important. This was not like a hobby I did on the side. I had a nine-year apprenticeship with him and ended up teaching and practicing in a hospital on the lake in Guatemala, in Santiago de Atitlan, if you care to look it up. It's quite a story uh, behind this hospital. There was a real tragedy there with a big mudslide. A bunch of people were buried and the hospital was buried right after they opened it. And so we opened and kept working and like the hospital sort of rose from the ashes. It's a tremendous, tremendous uh, success and, and, and feel good story. Um, and now, I mean, it's a, it's a tremendous outpost of, of, of conventional medicine, but I would have doctors come down and teach people and they would come in and learn some of the natural healing techniques that I had learned. Um, and we would run medical missions deep, deep into the bush in uh, mostly Guatemala. I remember one time, I was with a UN doctor from Nigeria who had also made his home in Antigua, the old capital of, of Guatemala. And we ran uh, insulin to a type one diabetic. Now we had to drive two days. Guatemala is not a big place. So it's about as big as West Virginia, right? But obviously if the roads are bad enough and right, it takes long enough to go any place. We took a four by four way into the interior of Guatemala. God knows I couldn't find it again if I tried. Um, and really harrowing stuff, Henry. I mean, if people saw this, this was like, I remember we actually, at one point we had to park because the bridge was washed out or the, 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 the vehicle bridge was washed out from a very, very bad storm that came through um, Hurricane Mitch, I think in 1998. And then, and it hadn't been rebuilt in all those years. And then we took a swinging bridge like Indiana Jones across this river, this raging river where you're, you're looking down thinking, boy, oh boy, I sure hope the wood doesn't give way. And, and then up along a cliff and we're hanging, looking over the side and right into this uh, Pueblo where the people didn't even speak Spanish. So it was very odd. It was very awkward. We had some students and observers with us and we brought the insulin to Rosa and everybody stood around. Nobody could converse. Everybody just smiled and gestured and nodded and mm and odd and right and, and uh, eventually shook hands. And, uh, you know, we had a cup of Rosa Jamaica tea, I'm sure. And then on our way, we went two days back out all the way back to the capital. And so it was an outrageous experience to be having, especially for a guy who I, I had an interest in medicine. I had no business traveling with you and doctors, that's for sure. And, uh, and yet I was able to somehow glom onto this and, and have these experiences in, in a way that, you know, I, I don't know a doctor in a thousand who's had the kind of, of medical experiences that I've had. Um, even people who, who try to do such things and doctors without borders and this kind of stuff. Um, it's very hard to, to reproduce the kind of uh, sort of adventure that I had in medicine, all because I set myself out to, to have that kind of, uh, of life. I mean, yeah, that's crazy. The <laughs> washed out roads. The What language in Guatemala? Is it a, like a native? In my little Puebla, they speak Quechiquel. Um, and then across the lake on a different side, they speak Tzutuil. And then Quiche. Uh, Quechua, I think the whole body, the family of languages, I may be wrong about this. There's actually a program in Kansas State or Kansas University, either one, that teaches a program in Quechua, if you can believe that. But I think the family of languages is called the Quechua language 
or possibly Quiche language, but I don't remember which, but uh, it hardly matters. There's probably not 100,000 people in the world that speak Quechiquel, um, but it is fascinating. It's like you hear these people as a very ancient uh, indigenous tongue uh, dialect. Um, it's nothing like anything that you would hear. It has nothing to do with Spanish. Um, it sounds like there's clicking sounds and like clacking in the back of the throat, almost like bird noises, right? It's, it's very odd. You imagine for hundreds and even thousands of years, the, pe the Maya people living in that part of the world must have listened to animals and listened to the sounds of the forest and then made noises, right? That came up with a, their, their language like that. So it's, it's a very, very authentic experience living that far in, in indigenous culture. It's one of the things people forget about uh, Central America is how deep the history goes. Like it, way, way before the Spanish came, uh, the Aztecs and the Mayans, uh, it was, I mean, it, the, the culture goes back so far. Ismael, which I brought up earlier, has three official languages. Spanish is only one of them because right. the original uh, indigenous dialects are still spoken there. That's thousands right. of years after, uh, you know, they were conquered by uh, Montezuma and all the, the Spanish. Yeah, the conquistadors. Yeah, the conquistadors came in and, and changed everything. And um, yeah, that's exactly right. Like, remember, that there's, there's whole civilizations uh, that were down there that basically rose, fell, disappeared into the jungle. Uh, you know, they uncovered stuff in the last 20 odd years. They've uncovered ruins near Palenque, which is in the, the that part of the Yucatan Peninsula south of Yucatan, but like where uh, Guatemala and Belize kind of meet. Like that's deep, deep, deep jungle where the jungle is so voracious. And, you know, if you leave it alone for 100 years, you can't find anything there. But they uncover pyramids, piles, as my teacher used to say uh, uh, jokingly. Uh, uh, piles of rocks from a defeated uh, culture. Um, but, but, you know, when you think about the rise and fall of an entire civilization across thousands of years, I mean, all of that was going on down there. So, I mean, it's, you know, if you're into that kind of thing, it was very, very rich. It was a very, very rich experience, a very authentic experience. It's now a little bit adulterated because like everywhere, everybody's staring at cell phones and right, doing what modern people do. And obviously there's nothing romantic about the poverty, right, that these people are mired in. But the, the explosion of growth in the last 23, 24 years, just since I've known it and been there, is, uh, is, is reason enough, I think, for, for viewers and for people who care about freedom. Um, most of the people that we know from the club where we met and, uh, and, and played that poker game have done some version of taking a portion of their wealth, putting it aside in a fast developing part of the world, and then watching it just go up exponentially. Because once you identify one of these, and there, there's a lot of them. My little town is about 2,500 people. I mean, it's not, it's not a place you would think, hey, I'll go there and make a bundle of money on real estate. But it happened. And it happened because you can identify some of the very obvious markers that, that indicate that, uh, that a place is on the way up. And so um, it's all over Latin America that that's happening right now. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, you've had some other adventures throughout Latin America. Do you want to talk about? Uh, yes, I have. You've been to Peru, Colombia, Panama, Argentina. Yep. Uh, uh, you, we we started talking about uh, Panama, I believe. You want to talk about what you your experience yes. in Panama? Yes, I mean the most outrageous thing. Panama is interesting. I, I've been north of the city and I've been south of the city. I mean, it's actually east and west. I mean, the, the, it's kind of like an S, the way it bends around. But um, Panama City is fascinating to me. It feels like a place where there's all kinds of shady, seedy, uh, underworld kind of doings. And I guarantee that that's there. And, and the reason I know this, even though I'm not really looking for that when I'm down there these days, um, is because the, the, the canal is like a, a golden goose. It really is. I mean, they make so much money transiting the, the world's commerce through this. Most of the country is tied to the canal in one form or another. And it, it, it just, it's a money printer, uh, plain and simple, right? And they can raise the, the, the taxes and the tariffs on, on uh, ships coming through the canal anytime they want, anytime they need to. And so, you know, the fact that they're growing at, you know, 6% annualized GDP or whatever it is, whatever the exact number is, um, that's not stopping, right? The pr prosperity that you see in Panama is tremendous. I remember getting pulled over um, in Panama City. I can't remember what year this was. And uh, the guy's asking me, are you FABE? Or say e ah, and I said, "What's he talking about? What's this guy asking me over and over again?" He kept asking me and, and harassing me. Now, there's no FABE is is of course FBI. There's no reason the FBI would be doing anything in Panama, but he had a reason to ask me. I'm sure. And so, and maybe it's my haircut, maybe it's my general demeanor. Um, but he was convinced I was CIA, and I had to talk my way out of out of this very overzealous Panamanian. Uh, he was a cop, 
but I don't really know what his angle was. I didn't get down to the bottom of that. I did manage to convince him that I was nothing but an ordinary businessman trying to uh, essentially get home to my family for dinner and that I had business down here and that I was looking at investments, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, eventually he relented. But, um, but you know, such run-ins make you really aware that there's a whole lot going on in Panama that, 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 that is more than meets the eye. And uh, so it's an exciting place. It's an, interest, it's an intriguing place. You can imagine all kinds of things going on there because of the wealth that's being generated. Another place where uh, it's coming into wealth right now that you wouldn't have thought is Colombia. Like Colombia used to just mean drug land to me. Like that's, uh, it, and that's American movies as much as anything else that uh, all the, the cocaine comes from Colombia, right? But you spent some time in Colombia. Can you talk about some of the experiences you had there? Yes, um, not, not much time, but I did actually do a, a, a medical mission and a conference uh, that I attended there. But this was, this was, and Colombia earned that reputation, by the way. Obviously, they had, um, you know, they call them rebels. But of course, these are also people that, like you and me, want to be left alone by their government. Um, of course, the, the, the growing season in Colombia is so tremendous. You can grow all kinds of great crops there, including very profitable drug crops like the coca plant, like, uh, like marijuana, obviously for legal, legalized marijuana, it's, it might have the best growing season anywhere. Um, almost exactly like perfect amount of sunlight and all the rest. The, the country is beautiful. Like anywhere you go, it's just a stunning natural wonders everywhere you look. And we were in Guadalajara de Buga, which is way up in the mountains, but it's not, it wasn't far from the FARC territory or the FARC held territory. Uh, these people have now, obviously, they, they've, they've sort of made peace, but uh, I think like a lot of, I think that peace is as tenuous as, you know, the, the, the country is stable. And so um, we had soldiers uh, secure a perimeter around us for the time that we were there. It didn't feel very tense to me, quite honestly. But the very fact that, right, they weren't too many years out of, uh, this was the early 2000s, if I recall. Uh, and they weren't, they weren't too many years out of the 1990s, which was the bloody Wild West. I mean, it was absolutely, it was gunfights in the streets. I mean, it was, and, and, and obviously the drug cartels fought uh, tooth and claw for all the territory they could get. But all of that is really in Colombia's past. And, you know, to anybody who's looking at um, any kind of, sort of, hey, what if I had a base outside North America? I don't think you can do better than Col Columbia right now. Here's a piece of trivia. I learned this from our, our mutual colleague, Porter Stansberry. The one country that has never defaulted is Colombia. Um, it doesn't mean that they necessarily have like a great financial situation, but the country is so wealthy. And, uh, and, and one of the things I want to bring up, because, you know, I'm not telling stories to frighten people about what's out there. Part of the reason that, that I really enjoy Latin America and part of the reason that I want your listeners and your viewers to understand just how free you can be in, the, in these places is, yeah, for all their problems, for anything that you could say that you know, might go in the negative column about them, um, most of these countries have been through really, really shitty times in the last century. At some point, like Colombia, for example, what happens at the end of a bunch of drug violence uh, when people are blowing each other up and right, trying to fight over drugs is that people get really sick of that kind of behavior. And so you have this right, ebb and flow of, of bad times turning into prosperity. Most of the world outside North America has already been through some pretty, pretty rough uh, seas and rough sailing. And they're very much convinced that prosperity is a good thing and that we want to keep peace and we want, we want things to work the way that people benefit from commerce, right? And that everybody's sort of pulling together. If you find places like this that are on the way up, Venezuela is an interesting one to watch right now because obviously they're coming out of a really tough time. To go from zero to one or zero to 10, right? Um, as prosperity returns after hard times, uh, this kind of crisis investing, uh, we know obviously, right? Our, our other colleague, Doug Casey, uh, wrote the book on this. And so understanding how you can position yourself in a place that's on the way up, um, it, it's really true. You don't really need to know that much. You just get one or two places right on the way up with a minor investment that, quite frankly, you know, could go either way. Um, and suddenly you find yourself having just a tremendous, tremendous upsurge in your own prosperity. It's a, it's a life-affirming kind of thing because it gives you this tremendous, tremendous ability to go live in another part of the world, like, quite frankly, in a, in, in a style that you may not be able to afford in North America. And, and for all of that to happen very, very quickly, that's what happened to me. I think one of the things people have to do is break their kind of American only mindset um, because things in the rest of the world don't operate the same way they do in America. It's actually literally based on, like you mentioned earlier, different law traditions. So you have to understand that things are not going to operate necessarily like they do 
in the United States, but that doesn't mean there's not opportunities. One of the things I keep going, like I, I am kind of obsessed with El Salvador right now, just because I, I find, sure. I find the country fascinating for their Bitcoin adoption. Um, Bukele is just, I, I can't, he's fascinating to me because I don't know exactly how I feel about him. He's literally turned the country around from the murder capital of the world to one of the safest countries in Central America in, in the, the world. world right now. Yeah, right. Um, their murder rate went from the, the highest in the world to literally one of the, like lower than most states in the United States. It's nuts. But he also threw 2% of the population in jail. Now, some of those people have to be innocent. Um, but given everything that's happening there, their economy is exploding. They're coming up on an election right now where he has a 90% approval rating. You only see 90% in like fake dictator elections, right? Except this time in, in El Salvador, because of the dramatic transformation, you'd be crazy not to support this guy if you're Salvadorian because they do love the prosperity. And even though they know that not everything done was perfect, it's way better than what they had. It's like all these people were dying. Uh, is it better that everybody dies or a few people get thrown in jail that are innocent? As an American, that's a hard calculation to make. As a Salvadorian that's lived through a civil war and then years of cartel and drug, drug gang control, it's such an easy decision to make. It's stability it is revolutionary in some of these countries. So that's exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you find somebody like obviously B Bukele is he, he's a man's man. He's the kind of character and has the kind of character that you see appear in times of real chaos. Um, you know, I look at the so-called leadership of the United States right now, and uh, it's unhinged. There, there's, uh, there's no, you don't feel that there's any bedrock. You don't feel like anybody has any guts or backbone to stand up for what's right, or very seldom do you even come across somebody who might, you know, be, be capable of that. And you look at Bukele, you look at Millet, who gave that fire-breathing speech to the WEF last week as we're uh, recording this. Um, I, these guys are, and, and, and there is a, there's a concept in Asian culture that in times like this, you will see people emerge, right, who take this kind of stand, this principled stand. And so it's very encouraging, the fact that, because again, what does it mean? What does it mean that a place like El Salvador can turn itself around? If you place that bet 10 years ago, the, the odds were so long, right, that anything good could possibly happen in Salvador. And uh, it's true. You know, he's, he's, he put a lot of people with tattoos on their faces in jail. I don't think it's that hard to understand. But the delinquency rate will continue to drop because, and, and this obviously he understands this perfectly well, because people like prosperity, right? And, and it's not like if you're, if you're a gangbanger and you put MS-13 on your forehead and you're running around killing old ladies, right, to steal their purse and, and whatever these people are up to, um, there is no question about the fact that's not a great life for you, right? You, you may think your heart is nails and all the rest, but you're watching your friends die. You, you know how tough it is. And so when people get a, a taste of prosperity, they tend to like the way that tastes and, they, and it tends to bring everybody else along. So he only has to hold on. And I know I, I heard and read from, from several people in my network how he has set up his uh, administration to continue regardless of what happens to him, right? That they've set up a kind of decentralized kind of thing that allows uh, his, his plan and, and sort of their trajectory to continue. So it's tremendously encouraging, but it's a great example of exactly what I'm talking about, about what can happen in Latin America. Uh, Mele is another example you brought up in Argentina. Is it, am I right in saying you were married in Argentina? I was, yeah. My wife and I got married in a, in a, in a famous tango salon. Um, and obviously it was a, a celebratory kind of ceremony. I mean, they, they stopped the classes and like we had a, a dance with everybody. It was fa absolutely fantastic. The Argentine people are, are the longest suffering, most beautiful, most polite, most lovely group of people you could possibly come across. Um, I, I love Argentina. The, the, the time that I spent there, is, it's among the greatest, greatest of all my travels. I really, really enjoy every time I get down there. And uh, yeah, we, we were married there. And then we obviously did a, an official ceremony in the U.S. as well. Um, so yeah, I have some familiarity with Argentina. I mean, what's happening down there too? We got guys in our network on the ground uh, describing the unbelievable pandemonium of prosperity that's uh, at, least, at least coming. Obviously, he's got a lot of work to do. It's a very, very, he's got a tough road to hoe, right, to turn that place around. But, but the fact that people are on board with it, you know, the thing that also distinguishes somebody like Millet and the talk and anybody watching this, go watch his talk, right? Pull up the talk that he just did at the WEF at their dopey, uh, loathsome conference in Davos. 
Um, because what is the power of truth? It's right there. Here's a guy who's educated enough about Austrian economics, about the real way that right value creates prosperity. Not the do not the phony government thing about you know fudging the figures and trying to convince you that inflation is less than it is, but the real principles and philosophy of how prosperity is created. And he's plain spoken. And if you got like a sixth grade education, you can basically glom on to what he's saying. And because this guy is such a good teacher and he stands for the right things, here's one guy who's completely turning the tide. Right now, will he make it? We don't know, but right, we're watching it play out. From a marketing perspective, you can't underestimate the showmanship that comes along with it. He would not be president of Argentina if he didn't have the chainsaw and the over-the-top screaming and the, the big demonstrations. That stuff gets attention. And He's on generous. top of that, like you said, he actually is a trained Austrian economist. Like He has degrees. He understands the true nature of the economy, which no socialist does. Like This is the thing. Everybody's predicting on the left that Argentinians are going to rebel once they realize what social programs he's taking away, except the social programs don't work because the money's worthless. You, can, you can't you can give people money. Like there's not enough worthless money to give people to make them happy. And that's, that's exactly the same right. thing that's happening to the dollar. It's yep. going to be worthless before long if they keep going down this path. And you can't placate people with fake worthless money. So eventually the rebellion comes, the collapse comes, or you get to a point where you have, you know, 120% inflation and you elect a melee, who I don't even know who it would be in America, but I'm looking forward to finding out because yeah, right. it's not well, before long. It's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a close one um, because I, I don't see a way out of this. You know, Dalio was just talking about what a debt spiral is, where you're printing money to pay for the interest on the debt that you're printing money to increase, right? It's like, you can't get out like once that happens. And so, yeah, I mean, Argentina is a fascinating place for a lot of reasons. Bill Bonner loves to say, we're all headed to Argentina, right? If they don't get their act together. Does the U.S. have a window to turn things around? Probably, you know, probably we do. The question is, is anybody paying attention, right? Is anybody paying attention? And, you know, the thing that you and I talk about, Henry, and that I want to just bring home to your viewers is, um, the good news is you don't have to wait for these clowns to figure out how to make things better, right? There's a lot of things you can do in your life today. You have more opportunities to do more things to protect yourself from really stupid, out of control government than you've ever had before. Now, will that window stay open? Will you still have the opportunity to do these things as the situation unfolds and probably gets a lot worse before it gets better? Nobody knows the answer to that. Nobody knows the answer to, to you know, how much longer do we have before things really go off a cliff. Um, there's a reckoning coming. There's a reckoning coming. And we started this podcast where, you know, the question is, why, why did I feel this way? Sort of why did I set out to live my way, life the way I live it? Um, I'm now in the Caribbean. I pay no tax to the IRS and I'm very proud of that fact since I don't really approve of what they would be doing with that tax money anyway. And uh, basically enjoy my life minding my own business, trying to stay out of the way of some of the really stupid things that I see going on and helping other people to do the same. If you care about your freedom and your family and your, your legacy and what's coming after for your children and all the rest, now is the time, right, to be planting your flag and sort of taking steps, right, that are going to protect you from whatever's coming. Um, we have not lived through hard times in North America pretty much ever, right? Maybe if you want to say the unpleasantness of the 1860s, but that didn't affect anybody today, number one. And number Got two, 1930s. Yeah, fair enough, right? But even that, the U.S. was on the way up, right? We weren't an, an empire in decline. We weren't um, the currency was still sound, right? There were still reasons to believe that things would and could get better. Um, is that the case still? I don't know. Like, we don't know. We don't know if we're going to be able to pull together or if everybody's going to go at each other's throats. And like my Guatemalan taxi driver uh, was saying, right, that we're really headed toward a real conflagration and real bloodbath. Um, so it's a very, very interesting, right, the old Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. Well, here we are. And the question is, how are we going to get out of it? My message to all of you and to all your viewers is, um, take steps. You're not, you don't have to watch this thing passively and sort of let it wash over you, right? Like, like my drowning victim yesterday, good heavens. Um, you know, you don't have to be a, a victim while this thing comes and knocks you over. There's all kinds of things you can do to protect yourself and to protect your family and to defend what it is that, that, that you hold dear. And, uh, that's, that's my message to everybody. Well, that brings up an excellent point because, uh, on Wednesday next week, the 31st of January, 
we're going to be hosting a free webinar that walks people through your wealth framework. Now, this is kind of the framework you use. It's the exact framework you use with your like $25,000 consulting clients. When somebody comes to you with a high net worth, this is what you walk them through to get them set up, um, get some of their money offshore. So you just get started to get that process of residency and protecting yourself uh, going. Now, obviously, you don't have to leave the U.S. to start this. Um, so it's literally just a formula for securing your freedom. So we're going to be doing going through this entire wealth framework very quickly in a, a free live webinar. Uh, you can go to goxplan.com slash Tane. Uh, that'll redirect you to a sign up link for the webinar. Totally free. Um, there'll be a recording posted for a couple days probably afterwards. So if you don't make it exactly on time, you should still sign up. Um, but yeah, I'm really I'm really looking forward to doing this webinar with you because there's a lot of uh, stuff I think we can get into that that folks will find really valuable in that wealth framework that that will help them understand the world and why it's so important and exactly a couple of, like real practical steps for securing your future even if things like pop off in the next 30 days here. That's right. That's right. Just to be clear and to reinforce what Henry's saying, you know, this is a completely free presentation. There will be actual teaching. I'm going to give you some actionable steps. How do you really tap in? Like if you wanted to go explore some part of the world, like, Hey, I've always wanted to go here. And like, how, how would I be an insider very quickly there? Here's how I did it. Like, here's how I do this. When I go find places, um, you know, the people you should talk to, the ways that you can set yourself up, how to recognize, like, how do you identify a place that's really on the way up? You're going to learn that and, and a bunch of other stuff on the webinar in a way that could really set you free. I mean, my goal and Henry's, uh, our goal here is to really be able to generate in a very short amount of time, you do not need to go uh, travel anywhere to make this happen. Most of the steps you need to really protect yourself can be done right from the, the comfort of your, your own living room. Um, but you need to take steps, right? Some amount of action will, will certainly supersede and, 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 and really uh, will obviously trump uh, just information. My goal is not to give you a bunch of information. My goal is to actually help you do this. So please check it out. Yeah, that's goxplan.com slash Tane. Uh, and we will stay on as long as you guys have questions after that webinar. Uh, we're starting at 7. Presentation will probably go 45 minutes an hour or something like that. It depends how detailed we get. And then it's just Q&A. Whatever you want to ask about it, uh, stick around. We're, we're happy to do this. I think it's really important for the moment we're living in to not be held slave to like the sovereign risk of just being under the United States jurisdiction. Uh, it can turn on you pretty quickly, as we've seen. Look at the January 6th people. Um, you know, they're confiscating people's bank accounts, even in America. Look at Mercola. They didn't like what he said about the uh, the jabs. And all of a sudden, he doesn't have a business anymore. So I, it, it's not something to dawdle on. If you're at all concerned about this type of stuff, it's a free webinar. Go xplan.com slash Tane. Um, so yep. hope to see you there. Beautiful. Beautiful. And um, yeah, thank you, Henry. Uh, thank you for putting this together. I'm tempted to just address. I know a lot of people think that you know, making plans to set your life up outside your country of birth. Gee, isn't that sort of like cowardly running, betraying your nation, et cetera, et cetera. These kinds of like anti-patriotic kinds of comments and, 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 uh, and sentiment that especially people will hurl at you if you, if you figure out that that might be a smart thing to do. And the way I'm describing it, my thing is that um, it's actually – the most American of all ideals is to stand up for individual liberty. The idea of America is not about an elite group of politicians telling everybody what to do. It's the exact opposite of that. The government is supposed to work for us. The government is supposed to be restrained by our founding documents. What they're allowed to do to us is limited. Now, obviously, a lot of these ideas have been lost. My thinking is the best thing you can do to bring about a peaceful end to all the madness that's going on inside our institution, maybe not all of it, but a big portion of it, that it will come to an end when the best, brightest, most productive, and also, let's, let's be honest, like people who are productive and, and have wealth and can generate wealth, if you take a portion of that and you set yourself a, uh, apart so that you're not going to be damaged by whatever's coming in the U.S. and Canada, um, you've, done a, you've, you've struck a big blow for freedom and for liberty. Um, my fear for a lot of people is that what's coming is going to be the worst, worst events that they've ever dealt with because the likelihood of, you know, confiscations and capital controls and people controls. We've already talked about this during the, the, the lockdowns where it wasn't clear, you know, exactly how we were going to get our liberty back. That, that's a very, very dangerous precedent. So, you know, we think it's time for people who really noticed and, and sat up and took notice 
this is your chance to really learn some of the very, very best tactics and strategies. I went out and learned this stuff so that you don't have to spend 25 years figuring it out for yourself. It's going to be a super jam-packed uh, webinar with a lot of valuable tips. So please be there. Absolutely. So a very simple choice between freedom and wealth or uh, poverty and enslavement. So, <laughs> all right. I hope to see you guys there. Uh, again, that's goxplan.com slash Tane. And until then, everybody, stay free.